The Lord be with you. I feel like we should all get one cough out together. Are you ready? <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Good. The cough be with you, I guess. Yeah. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Scripture to the second chapter of the book of James. James chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 17 there this morning. James chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who was poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what's the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, may we hear what you would have us to hear, so that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. What's your favorite color, Dada? That's what Cole's been asking me sometime here lately. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite this? But what's your favorite color, Dada? Now, I usually respond by asking him the question back. Oh, I don't know, buddy. What's your favorite color? Now, of course, Cole's answer depends on the immediate context of the inquiry. For example, if he's playing with a blue truck, he'll look down and go, Ah, uh, blue. My favorite color is blue. To which I'll usually say, but I thought it was green. And he'll say, oh yeah, 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 it's green. I like all the colors. And then he says, my favorite color is rainbow. It's a sweet sentiment to be sure, but he always comes back around and asks me, but Dada, what's your favorite color? I'm 34 years old. I don't know the last time I thought about my favorite color. These days, if I choose a color, it's solely based on how easy it is to clean or whether or not it will hide stains or, or is the blue one cheaper than the red one or will the color and pattern of this shirt make me look a little less fat. That, that's, that's the extent to which I think about colors. I can't say that I've thought about my favorite color in a while. But of course, I do have favorites of other things. Dr. Pepper is probably my favorite soda. Cool Ranch Doritos, probably up there, favorite chips. Maybe Chili Cheese Fritos, I don't know. Depends on the day. Obviously, I prefer the more stylish bow tie to a necktie. 
prefer Chevys to Fords, and fall is my favorite season. We all have favorites, whether it's a favorite band, a favorite place to eat lunch, a favorite football team, although I don't think that really happens around here. A favorite flavor of ice cream, maybe a, a favorite brand of clothing. We all have favorites, and for the most part, there is no harm in having favorites. My preference for sushi does not cause you any harm, even if you're crazy and think sushi is terrible. We have favorites because our life experiences have shaped them. They've shaped our tastes uh, because the chemical connections between our tongue and our brain have a certain wiring to them. Because there's a, a type of music, a certain song, when it comes on the radio, takes you back to a certain time in our lives. There are all sorts of reasons we have favorites. And there is nothing wrong with having a favorite color, a favorite soda, a favorite ice cream, or a favorite style of music. It is, however, nothing short of a sin to show such favoritism when it comes to those who are made in the image of God our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters. It's this precise sin of favoritism to which James is calling out the people in the text in our, before us this morning. Now this may, this may just be an example, a, a what-if scenario for James, or it may in fact be an anecdote, something that actually happened in the congregation to whom James is writing. But you can see what's happening, can't you? A rich man comes to church one Sunday morning, parks his Mercedes close to the door, strolls through the foyer in his tailored suit, his starched shirt and alligator shoes, takes a bulletin from an usher with a hand covered in gold rings before being shown to, uh, to the best seat in the sanctuary. I can even hear the usher saying to the folks sitting there, you're going to scooch now, scooch, scooch down, scooch, right? Before the service starts, the pastor makes a point to shake his hand before the service. Ask him his name. Where are you from? We're so glad. All the church, we're so glad to have you with us. Can I take you out to coffee or lunch one day this week? The church has rolled out the red carpet for this man because, after all, he's the kind of potential church member, the sort of prospect that you want. A man with means. He might be able to recover the, the budget deficit with a single check. He might be able to fund the whole capital campaign so long as we put his name over the door. Why, he might even be able to pay the whole mission goal for the whole year. He'd be a huge asset to the church. So, of course, the pastor, the deacons, the leaders of the church go out of their way to make this fellow feel at home. They want him to come back, they want him to join. He's got the moolah. But just as the pastor lets go of this man's hand, in through the back door comes a smell. Not an overwhelming smell. Not something obvious like a burning tire. No, it's the kind of smell that makes you just a little squeamish. The kind of smell that hangs out in your nostrils, and then long after it's passed, you, oh God, there it is again. Something between cat urine and sour milk. And that odor drags a man through the back door in unwashed clothes, greasy hair combed straight back, patchy beard, shoes that look like he's walked from the moon in them. His nails are too long, his teeth are missing. There's no outstretched hand with a bulletin for him. No one shows him to a seat. Instead, an usher comes up and asks, can we help you? Are you looking for something? Questions disguised as concern, but are really more accusations. The man is told, just wait right here. Service is about to start. They go get him a folding chair out of a closet. Here, sit right here. And when the service is over, before the amen of the benediction, he is shown out the door, given a card, a, a pamphlet from the local soup kitchen, told where the, the clothes closet is, and then as he's ushered onto the sidewalk, they say, we'll pray for you. The carpet's rolled out and the door's held for the rich man, while the poor man is shown the door and kept from tracking his filth on the carpet. 
Now, which one do you think was the church's favorite? James says, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, he doesn't even get a please. Did you notice that? James says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's what favoritism is, isn't it? Judgment. Picking one over another because you've decided that one is more worthy than another. Choosing one over another because the other doesn't live up to your measure. Because the other is deemed lesser due to some shortcoming, some difference you might see in them. It's judgment. Favoritism is judgment. But here's the thing. The thing that lets us get away with favoritism, James said, is that we've developed our own list of excuses and justifications for our judgment of others. I mean, you can hear it, can't you? I hear it right under the text. I can hear it. Well, someone like that rich man could do a lot of good with his resources. You know, he's just, the rich need the Lord too. You don't really know where that poor man's been. You don't really know. He might be casing the joint. You don't know what's going on. I'd rather, if I have to hurt one person to keep my baby safe, I'll do it. That's what we say. I know. I've heard them all. I've said them myself. We're quick to distance ourselves from such folks by throwing some loose change in a cup or avoiding eye contact. And then there are those times, those instances, when we justify our distance by simply promising to pray for them or pass them on down the chain of assistance. Oh yeah, we we even see it in the example from James, don't we? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, a nice little blessing, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. Go in peace, we'll pray for you. There, now I've done my part. I suppose it's easy. Easy to interpret that the right act of faith is to simply be nice. To just be nice to people we don't want to be around. To just be nice around people we don't like. Just be nice to be people that we have judged to be less than our favorites. But nice isn't what our faith is about. The words of my good friend Josh Hearn, you can't eat nice. And that's why James scolds the readers in these words. If a brother or sister is naked, lacks daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and you you do not supply their bodily needs, what in the world is that good for? You can say all the right things to someone. You can try to patch over your judgment of someone by offering them churchy words, empty Platonisms, or Bible verses. But if that's all you have to offer, If that is all your faith is made of, is a string of bumper sticker slogans, proof texts, well wishes, and vague worn out one-liners, you don't have much of a faith at all, do you? If you excuse yourself from actually engaging with others, James says, from actually walking alongside someone in this life because you've decided they aren't included in your list of favorites or your list of God's favorites, James says, what sort of faith is that anyway? When I think about these sorts of things, when I think that I've got that list figured out, when I've sat down and decided who's in and who's out, who's worthy and who's not, who's God's favorites, and and who still need to get right with the Lord before they're put on that list, when I think about these sorts of things, I have to stop and think about whose lists I'm on and what side of that list I might find my name. Because you know it's true. For every name I exclude from my list of favorites, I'm left off someone else's. For every person that I deem unworthy to put on my list, there's someone else judging me for how unworthy I am to be on there. You know it's true. I'm not talking even about you, I'm talking about me. You know it's true. It doesn't matter if there's a REV period in front of my name. There are people who still, he's bound for hell. It doesn't matter. 
For every person who I put on the list of unworthy, someone else has put my name on their list of unworthy. And the same is true for you. How does that make you feel? What's your initial reaction, your gut reaction to be left off, to be counted as less than? I think from time to time we need to be reminded of what that feels like, especially when we find ourselves drawing the line between favorites and those who don't make the cut. Whenever we're quoting Scripture to talk about who's in and who's out, maybe we need to be reminded somebody's quoting Scripture about us not being in or out. You know those folks at Williams? They got them women deacons. I don't think they're going to make it. You've heard it. Whenever we look the other way to offer up our baptized excuses for ignoring the needs of some in favor of others we preference, remember, there's somebody doing the same to us. I think we need to be reminded of that every once in a while. But then again, I'm finding that maybe, maybe there's some who've never known what it's like to be outside, to be told, as the poor man is in the congregation in James, to stand there or sit at my feet. That there may be some who, who never know what it's like to be on the receiving end of an injustice, on the other side of privilege, on the outside looking in. I think for a lot of church folks today, the experience of being the other isn't there. Because, let's be honest, the church has always been part of the in crowd for us. So I get it. It may be hard for some of us to imagine what it's like to be excluded from a list of favorites. But isn't that all the more reason to listen to those who have been? If we can recall when we were left out, if we can listen to those who are still being cut off and left out and turned away, then, then I think we begin to move away from what James calls the sin of favoritism, the sin of judgment, and we begin to move closer to that which Christ calls forth from us, that which Christ has shown to us. Mercy. That's the opposite of judgment. That's the antidote to judgment. That's the greater call than judgment, is mercy. Mercy is what sets us free. It's the grace to see past whatever may keep us from God's list of favorites so that we may be included. Mercy is the only reason any of us, all of us, are able to be anything other than damned. And yet we take God's mercy for granted. And too often we live our lives absent of that shared mercy with others, Choosing instead to see their differences, their faults, their failures, their choices, their identities as worse than anything we can ever imagine or anything worse than any of us would ever do. And therefore, they are outside the realm of God's mercy. How quickly we forget that we are included in the kingdom of God only by the mercy of God. Only by the love of Christ and the grace of God and nothing else. And when we remember this truth, that we ourselves are saved by God's grace, that we are included only on the merit of God's unfailing love for the world, that it's by Christ's work in life that we are justified and not our own, when we remember that, our lives cannot help but be transformed into vessels of that same mercy towards others, regardless of who they are and what we think they're worth. When we take hold of what James calls the law of liberty, to love God and our neighbor as ourselves, we can no longer judge others. But instead, we show them the opposite of judgment. We show them mercy. Mercy, according to James, though, is not some intangible idea whereby we feel better about ourselves for just not simply thinking less of people. Mercy is real. Mercy's got some back teeth to it. Mercy is what love looks like when we give it to those we don't think deserve it. That's why James says, so speak and so what? Act 
as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has no, shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. And then that word, that, that, that rest of that passage that arrests me every time and it ought to you. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? And the NRSV says, can your faith save you? But that's not what it says in Greek. It says, can your faith save him? In other words, if your faith doesn't have enough legs to it to feed somebody who's hungry, to give somebody a a cup of cold water who's thirsty, to put clothes on someone who's naked, if your faith doesn't have any feet to it, what good is it? So faith, James says, by itself, if it has no works, is dead. You see, mercy is an action. It has legs. Mercy isn't about telling someone you love them. It isn't about telling the poor, lonely, hungry, and cast out that you'll just pray for them. Is that all Christ did for us? Did Christ just walk up on the Sermon on the Mount, look out around us and say, you're all sinners, but I'll pray for you? No. Mercy is about proving the faith we have in Christ to those outside of our ideas of what's right by loving them anyway. Mercy is about proving that just as Christ loved without condition, without prerequisite, without our possession of all the right answers, that we love others the same way. And don't think for a second that some properly placed words about the unfitness of another or some biblical undressing of someone's sin is a fitting definition of love. Is that all Jesus did for us? When Jesus was nailed on the cross, did he look out and go, well, now I know you've been running around and I know you've broken this law and you've broken that one and that's all you need to know. No. Christ's mercy is not contained in pointed sermons or lectures about the need to get right before we get left. Christ's mercy is shown in the reality of the cross. God's love is shown what Jesus did for us, for all of us regardless of whether or not we may otherwise be called favorites. And that's the whole point, isn't it? That's the whole point. God doesn't play favorites. So why do we? Why do I? God's judgment is not based upon where we fall on some scale of sinfulness or upon how many boxes we tick on some list of sins. God's judgment is, in fact, just this. Love and mercy and grace. It's mercy manifested in the very presence of God dying on a cross and with His last breath speaking words not of angry retaliation, but of forgiveness to the very ones who nailed Him there. Because in the end, James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. In the end, it is Christ's mercy, Christ's grace, Christ's love that triumphs over it all. So what does that look like for us, for you? What does that look like when we stop thinking we're on some exclusive list on God's desks, judging those we're certain aren't on that list with us? What does it look like We start living as those freed by God's mercy in Christ to share that same mercy with the world. What does it look like when we live into the reality that that mercy has triumphed over judgment? What does it look like when the people of God who call on the name of Christ begin to live in the fullness of the grace of God? Love and mercy of Christ to everyone. What does that look like? Let's find out together. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we are humbled and thankful for the mercy and grace that you have shown to us. 
Lord, make us mindful, ever mindful that that grace, that mercy, that love extends to all of your children. And that, Lord, the way it is extended is through us. That we, those who call ourselves the body of Christ, are to be about showing that mercy, grace, and love to all. Rich, poor, indifferent of who they are. Because, Lord, you showed it to us, indifferent of who we were and who we still are. So, God, help us to take hold of that truth. May it empower us to live it with every breath that we take. And move among us even now, Holy Spirit, we pray showing us more and more of who it is you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.